Hello, welcome to Watching Movies with me, Penny. And me, April! (laughs) And we just watched, I'm not ashamed to say, uh, fewer than two hours ago, The Road to El Dorado. Correct. Which is a movie that we did not watch as kids. What were the major movies that we missed out on as kids? That in our we house, because we on? well, because we, like in our house, the big, the big movies, right? Yeah. As kids, Princess Bride, uh huh, Goonies, I'm sure, Aladdin, Aladdin, The Lion King, The Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, Beauty and the Beast, Toy Story, Pixar, sure, etc. Sure, I feel like there were some that we missed out on that we had to pick up in other people's houses. So Hercules, for example, yeah, we did love, and it. I think it was kind of a web classic, but yeah. we didn't own it. Correct. I feel like a lot of those like Disney movies that weren't like the classics, I didn't watch at our house. Really? Yeah. Like what? Like, I don't know, like The Hunchback of Notre Dame, we never watched. I don't think I've watched that entire movie the whole way through. I don't know that I have either, but I just vividly remember watching that at the Westendorf's house. A movie I was thinking of when we watched this, Anastasia. Oh, yeah, great movie. Yeah, but not one that no, we, we didn't had at our that. house. If we didn't own it on VHS, you know. Didn't exist. No, it wasn't happening. Shrek was a classic for us. <laughs> Maybe something to revisit at a later point. Yeah, Shrek. <laughs> but this was a movie that yeah it just kind of fell through the cracks and i feel like not just for us but for yeah i don't feel like it was particularly popular in general i did see when i was reading about it it's kind of got a cult classic status it got more popular later over time yeah yeah and i don't know what the the reason for that is but i can tell you i did not watch it as a kid yeah my high school girlfriend showed it to me and i was like this movie is great we were not the only ones who didn't watch it as kids because this movie was technically a flop in the box office. Right, right. And Which is, supr- I mean, surprising to me because I, I do enjoy it. But then again, I never saw it, so right. it makes sense. I had never heard of it even. Apparently there was a whole, they were going to have sequels. Of, like this gang conning their way into more gold, like Legends of Gold. But it flopped so hard that they were like, no, never mind. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, well, of course we'll get into the plot, but it's a perfect stopping point. Yeah. This is how you should end an adventure movie, saying more adventures to come and that just we never don't do them. them. Yeah, yeah. Don't need any more. <laughs> yeah. That's the right way to end this kind of adventure buddy movie. I agree. The Road to El Dorado, 2000. What a year it was. This was directed by Bebo Burgeon. <laughs> <laughs> I did not even write down any of the director's names because I didn't know any of them. <laughs> I did write it down just because I, I want to give credit to sure, them. Sure, yeah. But um, this guy, Eric Bebo Bergeron, 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 he's a French animator and director. Um, this is not his only movie. He also directed Shark Tale, okay. starring Will Smith. Also has kind of a cult following now. Like a meme, a meme cult following. <laughs> yes, um, he also directed a monster in Paris, Never which I wrote question marks by. So yeah, <laughs> same thing. And that's all he did, basically, okay. as a director. Okay. But as an animator, he did a lot of cool stuff. He worked on Five Goes West, nice, which is cool. Fern Gully, terrifying, a goofy movie, great. So I, he, he seems to have like a real grounding in kind of serious. I want to call it serious animation. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, real stakes. Yeah. Like, not realistic, because it is all obviously very animated, exaggerated. Right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, but these... It covers real problems. This this whole field, though, Fievel, Fern Gully, and a Goofy movie, and Road to El Dorado, these are all of the movies I've heard of and didn't watch as a kid. You never saw Fern Gully? I... They all fall in the same category. I've seen all these movies maybe once mm. in, like, the gym. I was going to say, Five Will Goes West and Fern Gully, I saw at school yeah. somehow. Yeah. They were put on TV to, like, yeah. teach us about nature, I guess, or immigrants, like, <laughs> or Mayan civilization. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they're a very specific niche genre within yeah. animation. So he seems to have a specific angle. That's interesting. It was also directed by Don Paul, who... 
has no other, <laughs> might not exist for all I know. Wow. And this was both of their directorial debuts. Okay. Which is kind of, so, like, they have a very firm vision, it feels like. Yeah. It, there's, it seems like there's a firm hand directing the entire movie. Yeah. That's those, I mean, I, you didn't even write them down, so no. I assume you well, have nothing to say. I knew you were going to talk about them, but. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> the cast. So while we were watching the movie, <laughs> uh, I was mentioning some people's names yeah. who are the, the voice actors, um, but not our main duo, Miguel yeah. and Tulio, the, the con artist uh, buddy adventurers of this film. And we were talking while we were watching it and saying, the, the, they sound yeah. familiar. Yeah, they I sound just like, knew that I would uh, look them up on IMDb and then be like, oh, that's how I recognize Did those. you have that experience? Well, kind of. Um, so the voice of Tulio is Kevin Klein. And what I recognized him from was he does a voice on Bob's Burgers. He's Mr. Fish Odor. Right. And that's what I recognized him from. But also, apparently, he was Maurice in the most recent Beauty and the Beast live action. It seems like he's been getting lots of voice acting so. going recently. Yeah. Um, I know him as uh, Will Smith's partner in that second Will Smith reference in this episode in Wild Wild West. Oh. That's him. Really? Yes. I guess I didn't scroll that far in his IMDb. illustrious career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's he's one of these names like I felt like that when we watched Con Air and I was thinking of John Malkovich and John Cusack. Uh-huh. And it's like I feel like this guy's been in everything, but I've not watched basically anything with him in it. Yeah. And he does have a huge career, but I haven't seen yeah. any of it. And also he it he was not a recognizable enough name that when I heard his voice, I no. was like, that guy! Ah, like, it's Chris Pratt. Yeah. I knew it. Um, but Miguel, voiced by Kenneth Branagh, Branagh. Yeah. who uh, has a, a kind of wild career in general, done a bunch of documentaries, um, d- a lot of Shakespearean acting, Gilderoy Lockhart, yeah. He's, he's kind of all over the place. He was in Murder on the Orient and Death on the Nile. Hmm. I haven't watched either of those. Me either. <laughs> they were just recognizable. Um, apparently they wanted Antonio Banderas for Tulio. I could buy that for or a dollar. Or they considered Adam Sandler, Ugh. which is bizarre to me. Well, I think they took a good middle ground there. And then for Miguel, they considered Jim Carrey. No, I don't think that's it. Imagine an alternate universe where it's El Dorado, where we have Adam Sandler and Jim Carrey. Adam Sandler, no, don't <laughs> don't buy that at all. Jim Carrey does voices, though. He could yeah. he could have done a good job. Adam Sandler is only that's ever a weird Adam choice. Sandler. I like these two. Well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about these two particularly is that this is part of the trivia that I read, that they recorded their dialogue together, even though usually when you're doing that, you do it by yourself. Right. They decided to do it together, which maybe makes sense as to why they, like, I felt like their dialogue was, like, real quippy back and Very forth. Very snappy. Like, yeah. It's so, a great choice. I yeah. mean, uh, this is something we'll probably get into with the analysis, but a big strength of the movie is the dialogue. Uh-huh. It, it feels very, I don't know. Just very witty. Like, yeah. it falls into that same, those categories of The Princess Bride and Pirates of the Caribbean where everybody feels smart and on yeah, top snappy. of things. Yeah, Yeah. Which I really like. I like these two actors. I think they're kind of perfect because we both had the sense of, like, oh, these, these voices sound so familiar, but they're not. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't distracting to be like, oh, my God, no. this famous person is doing this no. voice. No, it was just like... They're good voice actors. I think that's what that means, is yeah. that they feel familiar and good without being like, oh my gosh, it's um, Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not a good example, because Tom Hanks was really good in Toy Story. But, but he sounds like Tom Hanks. Yeah. You don't listen to it, like or George Clooney, there's a good example. There you go. If George Clooney was a voice actor, you'd be like, okay, I'm listening to George Clooney, or Brad Pitt, or yeah. something like that. No, these guys, they, they blend in. I did think that it was David Hyde Pierce who was... It's not a whole lot like him. It kind of did. So maybe an alternate world that would be the same <laughs> world. Um, Rosie Perez as Chell. I didn't even click on her name when I went 
to IMDb. I'm going to say if you're in our age demographic, age 34 to 28. That's not my age demographic. <laughs> in the year of our Lord, 2022. <laughs> then uh, she's like, I, I feel like the reason I recognize her voice, if you look at her TV filmography, she's been in everything. And she was in a lot of Law and Order episodes. Oh. And so I think that's where I've heard her from. Interesting. But she's got a very recognizable voice. But as far as movies go, I don't recognize her from anything. Really? Yeah. I should have clicked on her name. I don't know why I didn't. Again, good voice actor. Yeah. Armand DeSante as Jekyll Khan. Jekyll. I know Armand DeSante from two things. One, growing up. In the, the age before legacy TV shows like Breaking Bad and The Wire and all that stuff, you had miniseries. So you would have like an eight-hour movie, basically, that would appear on TV across maybe a month, once a week. And they would cover all kinds of topics. Do you remember the Merlin miniseries? Yeah, vaguely. So that might be something we re- revisit because I think it's actually really good. But there was a, a whole miniseries about the Odyssey. Um, you know, the Greek epic. Right. The Iliad and the Odyssey. Yeah, Homer. I, I got it. Do you know? Okay. Yeah. I catch the reference. Thanks. So he played Odysseus, Armando Sante. Oh. And I also know him from the movie The Santa Claus, starring Tim Allen. There's a scene where he gets the list. Do you remember this? The big box of yes. all the... Everybody's names. Are they naughty or nice? And he opens the A's. Uh-huh. And the first name he looks at is Armand Asante. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Um, he's great. I don't know. I don't think he's done a lot of voice acting, but he's great as a, a terrifying yeah, villain. Yeah, he was good. He's very charismatic. We have Edward James Olmos as the chief. Don't, doesn't even have a name. Um, he's uh, William Adama in Battlestar Galactica, and he's also Gaff in Blade Runner. Obviously, you are a big fan of both of those. Uh, yep. <laughs> and I know both of those uh, things. He's good. And then we have Jim Cummings as basically everybody else oh, in the movie. this is Win- Winnie the Pooh? That's Winnie the Pooh. Gotcha. So the voice of, the new voice of Winnie the Pooh, he's not the original okay. voice actor for Winnie the Pooh, but uh, you, I mentioned who he was playing in this movie and in others, and you were like, he has insane range. Yeah. And he really does. So he's the voice actor for Winnie the Pooh. He, in The Lion King, he is Ed the hyena, the <laughs> that hyena, and he is the singing voice of Scar in uh, his big mm-hmm. musical number. In this movie, he is Cortez, horrifying. He is like five extras, basically, in uh-huh. this movie as well. Uh, if you hear any kind of like raspy, deep voice, it's going to be him. Good for him. Get your bag, Jim. Uh, am- amazing. Amazing. Come on. Okay. I mean, that's that's the cast as far as it needs to go. Yeah. What about taglines? You got a tagline for this movie? Yeah. You want my, my personal Your tagline. tagline. Okay. My tagline was, are your kids into whitewashed history and blowjobs? Then they'll love this movie. <laughs> I think you could also do the same tagline, but end it with, they will be. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. Mine's along a similar line here. I said brilliant structure, great characters, witty dialogue, daring animation, fun songs, latent colonialist under and overtones, a quintessential <laughs> 90s animated you classic. Only left out the blowjobs. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, it's funny because I say this is a quintessential 90s animated classic, and it came out in 2000. Yeah. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think this does feel like a relic of a bygone era. And I think that's why it didn't hit as hard as some of the other movies did, because it's like that era is wrapping up. Yeah. Because after this, you get something like uh, The Emperor's New Groove. Yeah. Which also plays with um, Mesoamerican yeah. stuff. Yeah, Aztec, whatever. But is much more playful and not nearly doesn't, as yeah. harmful. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with no, the it's, culture, it's essentially. No, it's purely <laughs> like fantasy. Yeah. Right? So I think that's why this one doesn't quite work, is because the point where it landed doesn't quite work. But I guess that's I'm, true. I'm getting into analysis here. What's the real tagline? Uh, the real tagline is, they came for the gold, they stayed for the adventure. 
I think that might be the that's best. That's the best tagline. That's so the best far, tagline we've for heard. Sure. And they just had one. That, that was the one. That is an accurate little yeah. encapsulation of the movie. It's a, a, an adventure where two con men, you know, learn the value of friendship and an, an adventure. Yeah. Cool. I like it. <laughs> best part so far. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get into the movie itself. Okay. Where do you want to start? At the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Spain. So I feel like the beginning is like maybe the best part. <laughs> I So I said act one is the best part of the movie. Yeah. Easily. So we open up, yeah, in Spain. What was the year? 1519 or something like sure. that. And it's these two con men buddies and they're gambling and... Um, cheating they have loaded dice and you get some of the best lines like really early on and i think if they had just like come up with an alternate con rather than the whole colonization yeah harmful stuff like if they had stayed in spain and were it was a different they're just con two men story yeah it would have been great yeah definitely so i really like the beginning they could have found a lost land in spain for yeah. example or Atlantis or you know whatever yeah they could have found something else yeah and it would have been yeah I agree act one is amazing uh we get some of our favorite lines uh-huh he gave me loaded dice he gave me loaded dice <laughs> it's great to see um very this is something that this movie has that I notice you and I and Samantha is a big draw for us is like very quickly you get what this character is about like, you understand what they're doing. Uh-huh. I think of the mummy, and, like, the first scene you see Benny in is he is being real, like, I don't know, s- like, simpering towards... Cowardly. Yeah, and, and then runs away. Yeah. Like, in the first ten seconds, you've met this character, and then he closes the door on Brendan Fraser. It's like, you get everything you need to know about this character straight away. Uh-huh. And that's true here, too. We see that Tulio is neurotic and wants to plan everything. And is cautious. Miguel is very like wide-eyed, adventurous, yeah. impulsive. But they're both on the same page as far as their partners, and and they love going on these adventures and having these cons together. Yeah. And uh, it's a brilliant introduction where they get caught, and they have to with this previously choreographed thing. They draw swords against each yeah. other and put on a big show. A dramatic for, play fight. Yeah. Yeah. And more great lines. Uh, you fight like my sister. I fought your sister. That's a compliment. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's brilliant. You yeah. instantly fall in love with them. And like the crowd, they're performing for a crowd and they're performing for us. You're on their side mm-hmm. immediately. And then, oh, whoops, they accidentally land in some they barrels. They trapped in some barrels and then loaded onto a ship. Heading for the new world. And here we get some of your favorite lines with Cortez yes. and his crew. So my <laughs> my friend group, for whatever reason, we really lashed onto this scene where, because uh, you haven't seen this in years, so yeah. you didn't know what was coming. Yeah. They get presented before Cortez, who is this like horrifying monster as, you know, basically he was in real life. Um, and... It's just the lines are so hardcore, so serious. so serious, so straight, and so hardcore in your kids' movie. They're brought in, you know, stockades in front of him, and he says, "My crew was chosen more carefully than the disciples of Christ," which already is like hilarious in a kids' and also, movie. Yeah, no kid is going to catch that <laughs> reference no. at all. I do not. Uh, what is it? Abide stowaways. Um, you will be flogged. <laughs> you will be flogged. <laughs> And then you'll be uh, shipped to Cuba. When we put in port in Cuba, God God willing, willing. you will be flogged some more. (laughs) Which is the greatest line. God willing. (laughs) I don't know why that's that in particular is so... Like, I'm praying to God. If everything goes the way I want to, you will get flogged flogged. additional times (laughs) afterwards. Which is great. Um, My crew has been chosen more <laughs> carefully than the disciples of Christ. It's, just, it's such a good juxtaposition, him and his crew versus Miguel Julio and Julio. And, Miguel and immediately, like bumbling idiots. Yeah, Miguel is like, Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Um, and then, so then they get thrown into the, to the brig. They get thrown to the brig. And uh, they plan a daring escape with our first of two animal companions, El Tivo. El Tivo, the horse great character yeah i mean you know 
better or worse like who in in terms of like animal companions in animated movies who what's the goat the goat companion yeah um because i'm thinking of something like uh apu in aladdin what about pegasus for hercules pegasus is very good yeah I mean, not an animal companion, but kind of falls in the same vein. The magic carpet, also in Aladdin, mm. is a pretty good one. I guess the Lion King is disqualified because they're all animals. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> but he does have that bird. The bird that follows him around. And the Lion King Simba has... Oh. Iago. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Zazu. Zazu, Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess that's true. But he kind of sucked. <laughs> uh, we we said multiple times we were watching El Tivo, MVP, most yeah, valuable well, player so in the crew. El Tivo was smart enough to give him the keys to get out of the brig. Immediately we learned that this is a horse of more than human intelligence. Smarter than most characters <laughs> in the movie, basically. <laughs> and um, he really wants an apple. Right. Because he's on half rations. Right. Which is very sad. He's a big fat horse, which we um, love. And then he uh, follows the apple. Hijinks and Sue. <laughs> they add their escaping on their little lifeboat. He jumps off of the ship. They have to save him. Immediately, Miguel launches himself because he's impulsive and, yeah. and good hearted. Good characterization. They're thrown into the sea and now they're adrift. Yeah. Great part of the movie. Yeah. Love the montage of them on the sea. Yeah. Um, I, I think I really love, I, one of my very favorite parts of the movie is they're adrift, you know, things are really bad at the sea. Like you see lots of, they're really struggling and Miguel and Tulio's like confessions to each other about how much they mean to each other. Yeah. So early in the movie, yeah. you see how real their relationship is. And, uh, Tulio's regret is that he didn't have enough gold and Miguel's is that he they didn't get to have didn't their have big adventure. adventure. And then Tulio says, you were the greatest adventure for me. And he said that Miguel says, and you made my life rich. rich. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's so funny. And so, I don't know, telling of it, the stakes, that is the stakes of the movie. These two characters are best buds. Yeah. And the movie has a very simple structure. They're best buds. Something drives them apart. They come back together. Yeah. Perfectly well established. And, it's so funny, and then El Tivo is like rolling his eyes at their <laughs> dying confessions to each other. Well, and then they realize that they've landed on a beach. Yeah, and they're, they get out and they're kissing the ground. Yes, till they come across a skeleton, right, with a, a sword thrust through its skull. And that's when they realize that they've they've got their map, and this is where they're supposed to be right. to find the city of gold. They're about to go on an adventure. So then adventure. what do they do? They blaze a trail. They blaze a f- fucking trail. <laughs> <laughs> on the trail we blaze. You'll hear us sing most of the song in our in commentary our commentary track. It's just, that, that song is the only part of this movie that really stuck with me for whatever reason. Because I think you and I used to randomly sing that a lot. Too. Yeah, we'd be heading out into the backyard to do whatever we were up to that day. <laughs> On the trail we blaze. I, I think part of what makes it so good is that there are lots of different ways to say on the trail we blaze because there's <laughs> on the trail we blaze and then there's on the trail we blaze <laughs> yeah it's solid it makes you want to blaze a trail and it really does their little montage of them blazing a trail and following clues getting naked getting real naked monkeys steal their clothes yep. they meet a new animal friend the armadillo the armadillo which was named after the director, did you know that? I did not. The armadillo's name is Bebo, Bebo, or Bibo, <laughs> or whatever that name is. That's pretty funny. Yeah. N- never spoken in the yeah, movie, no. so it doesn't really <laughs> matter. And he's really—I mean, he's a cute character. He's really just a plot device for later when yeah. they get into the sport. But that's fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. And I think, yeah, this is the height of the movie. Two buds on an adventure. Yeah. Funny dialogue. You should have just kept that up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> if you could just do that the whole way through, that would have been, it really would have been perfect. Yeah. If you could have somehow sustained that momentum the whole way through. I sound, it feels like I'm kind of shitting on the movie. I'm, I'm not. I, I do like it. It's just got some problems. It's got some issues, <laughs> uh, which come in Acts 2 and 3. Yeah. Basically. So they are blazing their trail and they make it to the stone. I did want to mention before we get to. Act two, basically, where it begins when they get to the stone. Okay. 
What do you think about the music in this movie overall? I like the music. I don't think that the music is as big of a thing as a lot of other of these musical movies. Yeah. There's like how many songs? Like three or four? I think there's four songs. Yeah. Because you get what? The Trailer Blaze, I think, is the first yeah, song. It is. And then you get We're Gods Now. Yeah. Oh, it's tough to be a god. And then after that, Miguel's song when he's roaming around town, like, uh, wow, life, yeah. this place is beautiful. <laughs> and then you get um, Friends Never Say Goodbye. I think those are the only lyric songs in the film. This movie is kind of, in my mind, like Tarzan, another movie that I did not watch. That's another good example. I'm not interested in, really. But it has, like, like because when I thought of this, I thought of Phil Collins originally. Yeah. Because it just had that same vibe. Yeah. It's music in the background. Like, the characters are not singing. Most you don't the see time. their mouths moving seeing the song. It's just, like... There's just songs. Yeah, going songs in the background. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think Trailway Blaze is great. I think it's right up there with my favorite songs in animated films. Yeah. And then all the rest of them, I had almost completely yeah. forgot. Because and they're not. that's not to say they're bad. No. They fit fine. It's just not like... I think of Aladdin, I could sing every single one of those songs. Yeah. Like... Uh, Never had a friend like me. Mm-hmm. Obviously, great. Um, Prince Ali, Ali, fabulous. Ali, fabulous. Ali Ababa, and then uh, I can show you the world. all iconic. All of them hit that level, yeah. and and this movie just the Trailway Blaze hits that, and then the rest of them are, you know, they're there. Yeah, it's fine. So yeah, okay, that's where the music's at. Yeah. So now they arrive at the the gates to El They arrive at nothing. They don't think that they're, I mean... They found a rock. Tulio is like, what the fuck is this? Right. Like, now we have to go back. Right. Because we're at a fucking rock. Right. And then we get a new character. Chell. Chell. She's problematic. Also problematic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, hmm. I guess maybe we should just uh, approach broadly the, the problem side of this movie. Okay. Because, again, I was inspired to suggest this movie because I was listening to a podcast about the Maya civilization. Uh-huh. And I thought, okay, clearly the culture being represented here is largely drawn from Mayan things. So do people think that this is kind of an issue? Yeah. The way they're represented in this movie and the way this movie deals with real world cultures right and real world history yes yeah is the short answer so i do have um a source that i want to bring up uh-huh. this is the indigenous geek girl indigenous geek girl dot wordpress.com uh, the article is the problem with the road to el dorado i don't know the credentials here you can read the about page i mean i have no way of verifying them all i can say is everything this person wrote about the movie makes sense to me I think they have a good point. So I'm going to read some of it. Okay. And I leave it to future Kenny to edit as much as needs be. And you can interrupt me when you want to. Um, So this person uh, is a Native American, the person writing this. So that's the angle that they're coming at it from. And they, they are reviewing media through the lens of an indigenous person, basically. So they say, I was 10 years old when the road to El Dorado hit theaters in the year of 2000. And they really liked it, basically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good stuff there. To say DreamWorks Animation had big shoes to fill is an understatement. How on earth was the road to El Dorado going to follow up the Prince of Egypt? In short, it doesn't. Not by a long shot. So let me scroll down here a little bit. First, the two main characters were Spanish. As a native child who already fought tooth and nail with my teachers about Columbus Day... I already knew something was dreadfully wrong about two Spanish men coming to an indigenous community and being treated as gods. Mm -hmm. That's the premise of the movie. Yeah. So you're already in a hole. Yeah. All in the hopes of stealing their gold. Right. I knew enough about Spanish imperialism that their lust for gold and riches was matched by their bloodshed and barbarism. There was nothing innocent about this treasure hunt. I knew how it was ultimately going to end no matter how uplifting and cute the film tried to portray it. Second... And perhaps the most devastating part of the film, 
was that the villain is an indigenous man who's punished by our protagonist by becoming a prisoner to Hernan Cortez. Mm -hmm. The same Hernan Cortez responsible for committing brutal acts of genocide against indigenous people in Central and South America. Again, as an indigenous child watching this unfold, I couldn't believe I was expected to be happy about the fate of our villain. I knew even then what the Spanish did to their native prisoners. The fact that it was treated as a comeuppance or karma was honestly shocking to me. Mm -hmm. Third, I could not stand any and every scene with the film's female lead, Chell. Mm -hmm. She is the only indigenous female character in an animated film at the time since Pocahontas. At the time, my young mind didn't fully grasp the cruelty of making this over-sexualized native woman the love interest of the very men whose countrymen would soon rape and murder women just like her. All I knew then was that she existed to be the eye candy for the male characters and occasionally make funny faces. Hardly the representation an indigenous child watching the film would want to aspire to. Yeah. Uh, there, there's much more. I suggest you check it out. Um, they continue and say, Chell's no uh, Eliza Maza. She is no Moana. She is no uh, Isla. That there's a bunch of better representation is what they're saying. And this isn't good representation. I mean, at rock bottom, she's trying to escape yeah. her home. She wants to go away with these two. And yeah, she's, it's, it's an issue. Yeah. It's an issue. Um, I saw, I saw this, that, you know, there were reviews by Roger, at the time. Roger Ebert and so-and-so like, oh, this is a good movie. And then I saw this, that indigenous rights organizations criticized it as sexist and racist and a uh, lack of historical sensitivity. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess I do know what to make of this. So let me draw a, a, a comparison here. I feel like as a white man, I feel similar to living in Illinois, having gone to the University of Illinois. We had, as our mascot for many years, Chief Illiniwick, uh -huh. a Native American chief from a basically inventive Native American tribe as the mascot of the school for a century, basically. And while I was at school, there was an active campaign to, hey... This isn't very good, right? Yeah. And uh, it got, they got rid of it. I remember having a conversation, because our parents went to U of I, and they liked this mask. I mean, it was part of their tradition. Yeah. As far as I was concerned, as a white guy, it was just like, it's just the mascot for the school. Yeah. But I remember a friend talking to me and saying, like, you know, what do you think of it? And my big point was, like, it's, ju it's just not for me to say. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, what, what does anything I say influence anything that's right. going on here it's not up to me to be offended or not offended right it's or for you to say i think it's okay yeah like, exactly that's... like how could i possibly right. say that and i feel like the same thing kind of goes here yeah. where it's like to me this is largely harmless but it's not for me to say yeah like how like what does it matter if i think it's like I can't be harmed by it right so who cares if i think it's harmless yeah we can't make that distinction so that's the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's it's an interesting place to to go because th these movies exist. Like th this media exists out in the world, and kids our age watched it. Mm -hmm. Do you think? I mean, it's this movie to me hits the same level of problem as Aladdin. Aladdin has a lot of problems with it in the way it represents Middle Eastern people. See, and like, I, you know, I watched these movies as kids and as, as a kid and then not really as like a full-fledged adult. So right. it's like when I think of Aladdin, I don't think of like problems with represent, representation of Middle Eastern people. I'm like, oh, Aladdin. Right, exactly. But I think, you know, this gets at something that if I were if I were going to try to make a movie like this today, for me, the world of Aladdin is a fantasy world. Uh -huh. It's completely invented. I didn't know. I mean, yeah, I was eight. You know, right. I didn't know anything about Middle Eastern culture. Right. It was just cool world. What's going on here? Yeah. I don't know. Um, you shouldn't do that with real cultures, probably. Yeah. If you want to make a, a fun, cool fantasy world, make a cool, make fun it all fantasy up. world. Make it all up. That doesn't completely absolve you of potential problems sure. because you can just carry over those things. Yeah. Like 
I think about orcs in Lord of the Rings and how like dark skinned people from faraway lands are barbarians and barely human. Yeah. You can still port over problems, but at least you're not just directly saying this culture is a bunch of savages. Right. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that was a big interlude in the movie. And basically, you have to... Everything going forward for me, I like the structure of the movie. I like the characters. I like the art. I do like the world. But everything, you have to put that little bit of an asterisk on of, like, issues. Yeah. Like, we're not endorsing. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And then it gets more complicated, too. I said I was watching or listening to that episode of stuff you should know about Mayan culture Mm -hmm. and there there was human sacrifice in Mayan culture and human sacrifice does play a role in the movie yeah so they run into Chell they end up getting taken into El Dorado yeah and immediately these people assume that they're gods these two white men are the gods and you know everybody's just because coincidentally there's like prophecies that seem to line up with and we them. meet our quote unquote villain, Shekel Khan, who is like, he can do magic. He's like, what? What would you consider him? Like a, a shaman? Yeah. A warlock? It Sorcerer seems like he's of he, some sort. He's made pact with actual deities yeah. somehow and can really do magic yeah. in this world. He's like, he's the only one who's portrayed as like religious in this. Like, He's like talking about the gods and yeah, looking at the prophecies and all that and saying like And no one else everyone else in El Dorado are just good people who don't really like they're afraid of the gods maybe. Yeah. And they they're not sure what to believe or they do believe, but they're not into human sacrifice. Right. And you mentioned while we were watching, maybe if you're so shy about human sacrifice and having, you know, your background characters into it, maybe just don't do the human sacrifice yes part. so we get to a scene where like tulio and miguel are the gods and um jekyll Khan is um like bringing an offering right and they're like "Ooh, what's it gonna be it's, it's a big bag. In this bag yeah and they t- take it off and it's a human and he's gonna sacrifice a human and they the they like look out at the faces of the people the citizens and everybody looks uncomfortable right Except for our villain, he's like ready to sacrifice this person. Right. And like, so, like, they were making this movie and they didn't want, you know, sacrifice to be a big part. So they, like, they fixed just, the problem. They that put it all way. on this one guy. Yeah. Like, maybe rethink all of it if you have to do that. Right. Exactly. So, one solution to all of this writing issue is what I'm calling the avatar solution, where. You take the exact same story structure and you make it about something fantasy. Yeah. Alien world, Atlantis, you know, not a real culture that existed. Still has its problems. Yeah. Because, like I said, you can port over a lot of those colonial things. Yeah. But at least you're not actually talking about a real historical people that still exist in the world today. Right. You know? So, yeah, I mean... Not the best. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Chuckle Khan, and then we have the chief who was like not into the sacrifice thing either. Like they they have a dynamic where very clear again quickly drawn. These two characters have some kind of beef. There's a tension there. Yeah, and it's like okay, chief, good guy, Chuckle Khan, bad guy. Like, Got it. You immediately get that. Yeah, and they even like the animation style and how they made. Uh, Chuckle Khan look like he looks like the the evil guy whereas the chief is like a big cuddly like he's got a big face and big features like big he, smile they made him look like the nice guy yeah. and he's like his offering to these two gods is a feast and like a celebration and yeah like, we're just gonna have fun yeah totally like okay <laughs> and Jekyll Khan's like let's throw this man into this pit right <laughs> <laughs> and we learn he he is a good villain basically he, he's a religious fanatic who truly believes that most of humanity is corrupt and evil and snake-like. And the gods, he believes the gods want some sort of cleansing, purging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's his whole motivation. And eventually he does 
discover that these two gods are not gods. Yeah. And that is one thing, like, a check in the favor of the movie, because we've been talking about it's how problematic it is, the natives are not stupid. Right. They basically fool no one. Like, the, the trick lasts for, like, 20 minutes yeah. in the movie before people start figuring out right. they're not really gods. The chief pretty quickly is like, you can stick around. Like, yeah. <laughs> if you just want to hang out here, that's out. cool. Like, that's fine. <laughs> you can just chill. Yeah. Um, and Chell instantly knows they're phonies. Yeah. She overhears them. And is also a con plan. woman herself. Right. So she's kind of in cahoots with them because she wants to get out of there as well. So their plan is to get all the gold that they can. Revel in being gods. Get on a ship and go back to Spain. And she wants to come with them. Right. So, and the, again, problems. Like, the native woman is like, very sexualized. Yeah. Problematic as a child watching this movie. Like, you were talking about, like, confusing signals, like, stuff you watch as, like, a an eight-year-old, where you're like, I don't know what I'm looking at yeah, here. Yeah, they're always trying to make the woman look real sexy in kids' movies. And, and, and you, not, not just this movie. No, oh, no. And the, so many, so many kids' movies. You, when they were, like, entering the city, you were like, look at all these different, like, body types yeah. and people. And I do like that in this movie. It was really cool, but, like, why did you make... Like, the main girl could have looked like anything. Sure. But she was teeny tiny waist, giant hips, big ass, Slim, big, perky breasts. Like, yeah. very obviously. Huge cheeks, yeah, cheeks, yeah. Very obviously. Hypersexualized. Yeah. Big time. And, I mean, that, that you know, indigenous geek girl, completely correct. She is, like, a sex object for these two characters. Yeah. Like, instantly. Yeah. And it's not, like, not subtle. I would say. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not just in her shape, but like the dialogue, everything around it. Yeah. She is a, she is a plot device. She's a wedge between yeah. our two leads, basically. Yeah. Um, I will say something I do kind of like is that, and I mentioned this in our commentary track, even though she's kind of a wedge between the characters, ultimately she does become part of the group. And one of the characters winds up being her love interest, Tulio does. Mm -hmm. And Miguel's not upset about the fact that, oh, I wanted her and now you have her. Yeah, it's not a love triangle. No, it's not. He's like, I thought we were partners. <laughs> yeah. And you went back on your word and you said you don't want to forget me. Yeah. That's what he's upset about. I like that. I'm yeah. glad that she's not like strictly an object for them to fight over. They don't fight over her. No. Which is, you know... A relief. There's a different version of this movie where... It's even worse. <laughs> yes, it is. Where it's like they're fighting over her and she's playing them one against the other. Like, yeah. It's a really gross version of yeah, the movie like that. that goes down that road. Yeah. It doesn't do that. Yeah. And I... I don't know. It's so tough because there's all this colonial side on one hand. On the other hand, I don't mind it being like... It's a sex-positive movie. Like, there's nothing... Like, sex is not shamed in this movie. You know what I mean? I guess so. <laughs> I mean, that's not like they're like, yeah, sex, but like, no, they're like, she, they're like massaging each other and right. smooching, and that's all fine. Yeah, and there's like, I mean, you don't get like, I think again, going back to like, Aladdin is like the perfect comparison movie here because it has like this romantic thing going on, it has weird cultural stuff going on, and it's also an animated musical, basically. Mm -hmm in a different land, a different world. And, uh, you know, there's... Jasmine is sexy, but they kiss. Yes. That's 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 their relationship? Well, I think she's also, like, very young. <laughs> I don't know if they establish that. Jasmine? Yeah. I think she is. What, like, like 14? 16 or something like that. <laughs> they don't establish that. I don't know. Wait, I think so. Look it up. I don't know how to use this. Jasmine age. <laughs> 16! Alright, I take it back. Yeah. Which would result in Aladdin getting arrested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so okay. she's pretty young. I mean, this reinforces my point that both movies are fucked, I basically. I how old Chow is supposed to be. I guess you could look it up. What's Aladdin's age supposed to be? No, I'm just Googling things. Eight. <laughs> Eighteen. Well, that's not so weird. 
Uh, I, I mean, doubt that Chell wh- has Where are these page. numbers come from? They didn't write them down while they were writing the script. I bet they did. That's bullshit. I doubt we'll even get an answer to this one. Where do these numbers come from? This is I feel like, like they talk about her birthday. They talk about Jasmine's birthday in Aladdin. I feel like her dad does because she's supposed to get married to somebody. You must be married to a prince by your next birthday. I don't think they're specific. She say how old she is. Yeah. What were we talking about? I don't know. <laughs> we were talking about uh, sexualization. Sex positive in, movie. In, in these movies. Yeah. There's a blowjob scene. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't. There is not. You reacted to it, though. Well, I think it was pretty clear. They were trying to, like, you know. If you were a kid. Hair must. Right. It's like they came from out of frame and they both popped up. And right. They were all messed up. Yeah. And it kind of looked like she heavy. came, popped up from a little bit lower on the torso. I think it was intentional. I think it's, it's supposed I'm to be sure. like, if you're a kid, you're like, oh, they're smooching. Yeah. And if you're an adult, you're, you probably look to your spouse and you're like. They were fucking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which, you know, fine in general. I but it, again, in the context Weird situation. of. Yeah, in yeah. the context of white men going to an indigenous population. Yeah. Not the best. Not the best. We should talk about the game that they play. Yeah, so this is getting into actual Mayan culture. So there, I mean, I did, I was curious. I didn't know if the makers of the film were going for a specific culture or like an amalgam of a bunch. They were very inspired by Mayan culture, which I figured was the case because there are a lot of things that are specific to Mayan culture. Human sacrifice is part of it. Um, there's also, I mean, the architecture, the artwork is, but this game that they play where they're trying to shoot a ball through a hoop using their hips, uh-huh. mostly. It was an actual game that was played in Mayan city-states. And also carried with it oftentimes the winning team, the losing team, I should say, had to provide a human sacrifice, either the whole losing team or they provided someone from their city. Mm -hmm. This was a real thing that existed. And, you know, I think we can all agree human sacrifice is bad. Yeah. (laughs) Not a good thing. Not something we should aspire to or really, you know, respect of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's another reason not to maybe approach that or real world world cultures for that same reason right (laughs) right but it's a big plot device because so they're playing miguel and tulio have to play this game they're playing this game and obviously they play like shit because they're just two skinny white guys white guys and then they against a bunch of i I did like this so a little callback from earlier at the beginning when they arrive in el dorado they ascend the like temple steps all the way to the top and the chief and Jekyll Khan are like striding upwards and they are wiped. They are yeah. completely exhausted. So which, you know, makes of total they sense. Would be. Yeah. yeah. And in this game, it's the two these two gods, quote unquote, against a team of hardy uh, native men who live in this place and play this game and do real labor and they are beating their asses. Yeah. They have no shot until um, Which is a big deal because if they lose then it's clear they're yeah, not gods. They're done for. They've been exposed. So Chell sees the armadillo that when it rolls up looks like the ball and throws out the armadillo instead. And so they cheat their way which into is winning. Very classic of them. Yes. Into winning. And yeah. then uh, But in in the final moments uh, through a series of hijinks, they lose their armadillo ball. They get a regular ball, and now they have to really actually score the final goal, which they do. But in doing so, Miguel gets hit in the eye. He gets elbowed, and a little drop of blood flows. So they win, and he... The, Ooh, hooray, we won, we did it. And then Jaco Khan's like, now sacrifice this, right. these losers right. to your glory. And Miguel's like, eh, eh, eh. Absolutely not. No Everybody more human sacrifice. Up. I'm God. You guys are savage barbarians. More problem stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jekyll Khan realizes... He's bleeding. Yeah, he's bleeding. Not they're, God. They're just, Very clearly. They're just men. Yeah. Um, and it leads to a cool bit of world building that I really like, which is he asks his you know warrior guy... Why is it that the gods demand blood sacrifices? It's because they can't bleed. Uh They don't bleed. And he wipes the blood on... And then does some cool sorcery. (laughs) 
does some cool magic. Makes a potion. And then unifies his will with a giant stone construct of a jaguar. And he's like, I'm going to take these guys out. And it's at this point that I believe Jekyll Khan is the real hero of the whole situation. The hero? I don't know about hero, but he's... He's going to kill a lot of people with this jaguar. Well, I think one, you know, he's a native guy... He's actually right in the fact that there are clearly other worldly entities that he is in communion with. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, ignore them at your peril, basically. And there are these two dudes from Spain who are trying to take over the entire culture. Yeah. He's not wrong to think these guys got to go. No, fuck those guys for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't begrudge him that. But as far as yeah, as far as him eating innocent people and stepping that on that, sucks. yeah, that's not so good. <laughs> if there's a different version where Jekyll Khan is like, I'm gonna oust these guys, and it's like, yeah, yeah, you, you get should, yeah. yeah, get rid of these posers. This is like a pre climax climax. Right. It feels very epic. So he's going after Tulio Miguel with the stone jaguar. Right. They pull off their. The, what a good setup and payoff their little scene earlier in Spain where they're like, you know, you gave me loaded yeah. dice. He's like, you tried to, you made me. Yeah, they're having do this. another dramatic play And Jekyll Khan's like, ooh, yeah, yeah, punch him. And they trick him, throw him Tusha Bulba. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, oh, he's gone forever. Don't have to worry about him anymore. But the big conflict of the film is still not resolved because yeah. they're still not friends. Yeah. Miguel wants to stay. Tulio is going to leave yeah. in a boat full of gold with Chell. And they're not not—they're not apologizing to each other. Right. They're still very hurt with each other. They never say goodbye. And <laughs> that's the end. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jekyll Khan gets spit out at the feet of Cortez. Also bad. We covered this with uh, Indigenous Geek Girl, where she was talking about it's not good that this indigenous man's punishment for being bad is that he gets enslaved by yeah. a Spanish conquistador. That's no good. Yeah. But he's going to lead them back to El Dorado. So they're doubling down on Jekyll Khan. Cause, okay, so he sees Cortez and then he sees in his head like the prophecy and he's like, this, this is the guy, guy. This guy is who I'm looking for. Right. Let me show you to El Dorado so right. you can take care of business. Right. So they're like... He wants to wipe out people. Yeah. So they're doubling down on that. Yeah. Not great. No. Not great. <laughs> so our, our heroes now, This so I, I have two weaknesses of the film, aside from the big one that we've already outlined, mm-hmm. which is the problems with how they treat my culture, real people, etc. Yeah. Structurally, the only two problems I have are Tulio is a dick to Miguel. Miguel never does anything bad. Yeah. I think if you wanted to make... They should both be doing something not so great to each other. That creates a rift. And then we get to... They come back together. But instead, Miguel is just a generally great dude for the entire movie. He's a little impulsive. Uh-huh. I mean, fine. But he never does anything bad. Whereas Tulio, like, actually actively goes back on his word about... He, he's the one who's like... Chell is off limits. She's trouble, my friend. And he's the one who winds up sleeping with her. And uh, so, yeah. And that's not so good. I, I would change that a little bit. Not the biggest deal. Yeah. The other issue is that when they finally do come back together, you know, ah, we're buds once again. It's kind of just by accident. Yeah. Like... This whole crisis happens, and Miguel is like, okay, I was going to stay in El Dorado, live happily ever after, but... But now I won't. But now I'm not going to, because I just have to work to save the city. And he's like, let's go on another adventure, friend, and not resolve the fact that you went back on your word, and you're going to leave me forever for no reason, basically. Well, I'm sure they'll have plenty of time to talk about that. Well, so they... So, yeah. So, Tulio and Chell are getting ready to get on the boat. They're going to go goodbye. Miguel is going to stay. Then they realize Cortez is on his way, and they need to stop him. Right. So, like, you can't fight these guys. They have guns and armor yeah. and stuff. So, Tulio basically makes a plan himself. He's like, let's go crash the boat, crash, you know, the whole Close off structure. the entrance yeah. to El Dorado. So, they can't get in. Which they do. So, yeah. He gets on the boat. They go, and then they can't quite make it, and so then Miguel has to jump on the boat and help. Right. And that's how they end up being back together. Back together. 
And it's fine, and and you know they they ride off into the sunset, which is my preferred way to end these kinds of things. You know, I think about all, like all the great adventure movies, like Pirates, which I'm sure we'll watch again on this show someday. Yeah, that, that's how it ends. They're like, let's sail off into the seas and see what adventure yep, awaits us. New adventure. And then they didn't make any more movies, and it was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this movie actually, just because it didn't do well, this is the end yeah. of the adventure, which is fine. Perfect. Yeah. That's Who the, knows what they would have done with they would have, I mean, look <laughs> what they did with one movie. Another problematic, <laughs> another problematic movie. Yeah. No thanks. Yeah. They sail to Asia. <laughs> See what kind of shenanigans they can get into there. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, for me, that's uh, that's what I've got for analysis. Yeah. Do, do you have any other big notes? That's the film. All right. Well, final review time. Uh, what did you give this movie? I rated this movie six out of ten blowjobs. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, there were enjoyable parts, but like, big problems. Yeah. So yeah. it was kind of a middling. That's I. So I gave it a million pesetas out of a hundred million pesetas. Um, a million pesetas is a lot, you know. It's it's good. It's a good structurally good movie. And it was in my tagline. It's like, all the things you love in an animated movie. And also a big, fat yeah. <laughs> helping of, like, 90s, like, colonialism yeah. baked into it. Um, so I think that, as far as a recommendation goes, I think you need one of these two things to get you through it. One, you saw it as a kid. Yeah. So your nostalgia, nostalgia is going to carry you through there. Or two, you have to say to yourself, this was made in 2000. <sighs> It's no worse than Aladdin in its social justice issues. It has its problems. I'm going to walk in with eyes wide open mm -hmm. and, it, and be like, okay, it's got its problems. Think about Here them. Are some Deal good with things. them. Here are some, a lot of bad things. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's a shame. It's a shame because yeah. I think if in a different context, this could be amazing. But as we discussed in our commentary track, if you remove all that charm that they drew from real world inspiration, yeah, what do you have? It, what is it really? Yeah. Like it's a very simple structure. So I don't know. I don't know if I can, in good conscience, recommend this movie. It's more of like a historical oddity. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. All right. The end. The end. All right. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what a fraught journey that yeah. was, that trail we blazed in this episode. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to check out our commentary track where we mostly say, huh. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And we sing along. And we sing, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've been your Kenny. And I've been April. Talk to you next time. Bye. On the trail.